You ever just want to quit your job, buy a boat, sail around the world? Well, what if we told you that was possible? I'm Rad. And I'm Sasha. With more willpower than money and a dream to become pirates, we bought a sinking sailboat and spent the next nine months transforming it into one of the sexiest boats on the seven seas. There is nothing that can get in the way of us sailing around the world. So grab your popcorn, hit subscribe, and be prepared for one hell of a story. The story of our lives. This is the journey of Spirit Animal. Last week, Sasha and I got down and dirty in the port aft cabin, and I might have even lost my virginity hadn't it been for this massive DC electrical system we had to install, but I can't really complain much. I mean, look at this, 1350 amp hours of battle boring lithium batteries, an absolute dream electrical system on a sailboat. But now that we got the heart of the system beating, we still gotta send the electricity to all the panels to make it a complete system. And I know we also tried to sum up a couple lessons we learned and give you a couple pointers so you could get the basics of your boat's wiring. But there was a couple really smart keyboard warriors in the comments section that let us know that our definition of volts and amps were completely wrong. And it turns out they were right. We tried to explain it in a way so all these dumb loser nobodies could understand it. But we do not want to mislead them. So let me read you the proper scientific definition of a volt. There you go. Sure you get it now. We are getting rid of the old batteries. They are heavy as... Oh, <laughs> oh shoot. <laughs> oh, I don't know what I just did. How heavy did you say this? 500 pounds? Yeah, I think it's 200. Feels like it's twice as heavy as a lithium. So those are 8D AGM batteries and they are heavy. Like one of those weighs like two of the Battleborn batteries. And they're only like what, 100 amp hours? Yep. They're only 100 amp hours. And one of the lithiums is 270. Yeah. Upgrades. <laughs> Got it? We've been sleeping out here because it's so hot right now. Alright, we are working on the DC side of things now and AC. Oh wait, no, we've been working on the DC. <laughs> we're not working on the battery system right now, we're working on the switch panels. We've got a DC switch panel and an AC switch panel. And right now they are all weird and messed up. It's the old original stuff. This circuit board back here is is bad because even when like if I turn the fridge off that light stays on and we're drawing bad amperage and as you can see this thing is just had its days so we're replacing all of this we're gonna rewire the entire boat nothing works the VHF uh, the radio any of the old instruments are replacing all of that so everything is gonna be brand new and we are converting it from 220 to 110. We're putting in new outlets, but basically we're about to clean this up because right now it's super janky and nothing's working, so. No. All right. We want to thank this week's sponsor, Element. Element isn't just a powder to make your water taste better. It's made up of electrolytes, which are charged minerals that conduct electricity and help activate your nervous system and keep you hydrated. Between the hundreds of boat projects, Sasha and I live a very active lifestyle to help keep our minds clear and our stress at bay. During these activities, we sweat a lot. And when you sweat, you lose electrolytes, the main one being sodium or salt, which is why sodium is the main ingredient in Element. Element doesn't have all the BS ingredients the other brands do. They don't have any artificial colors, sugars, gluten, any of that. They have three scientifically proven ingredients to help keep your body at peak performance, which is why we like to stay salty. Right now, if you place an order with Element, you're gonna receive a free sample pack with your order that has all eight flavors in it. All you have to do is use our link, drinkelement.com forward slash spear it animal.
So the other day we went to Pacers Marine here in Fort Lauderdale. Just the rolls and this long cable of four aught was one thousand dollars. Oh, my jaw almost fell to the floor when she said that. <laughs> Grab your pliers and start cutting. For real? For real. Yeah. <laughs> My favorite part. Here we go. So the process began. Sasha and I started ripping out wires, tracking them down one by one. We had to figure out which wires were not working and going to random places. There were fuses and relays that we had no clue what they did. So we went with the cut first, figure out what doesn't work later technique, which we do not recommend. However, in our case, we pretty much cut everything out, so nothing worked at the end. Uh, oh my uh, god. Uh, it didn't really dawn on us how big of a project this was going to turn into until we had cut back all the electrical tape, exposed all the wires, and realized it's going to be pretty tough to put these wires in a more organized way than what the boat dealer does. And honestly, if the wires were still good, it's better to leave the system exactly how they have it and probably just replace the circuit board and move from there. But a lot of our wires were damaged, corroded, stiff, and cracking. We were finding wires that were green and oxidized, which means water and air was getting to them. Wires that were black inside, which means there was too much amperage running through too small of a wire. Lightning could also be a culprit, but between finding all these random wires cut off that are not doing anything, and all these sketchy connections, it's most likely from all the jimmies that were rigging this up before us. Check out all the garbage wires. We have taken quite a few wires out. So we were thinking of trying to reuse some of these wires, but they're so stiff, and most likely they're bad, so. Yeah, listen. That's not good. Stiff from here to here, it won't bend anymore. I think it got cooked. And this is why we are being so meticulous. Raph's brain is going crazy. <laughs> This, this this is the standard wire that came in the Beneteau. And if you look at it, whoa! It's all copper. It's not it's tin not tin coated. coated copper. See the strands? There's a little shield around it, so maybe that classifies it as waterproof. Now I'm not saying this is the correct or incorrect kind of wiring because our boat has been through one hell of a whirlwind. But after finding all of the corrosion and the stiff wires everywhere, it makes me wonder if this was an area that Beneteau tried to cut costs in production. However, we did find one area where Beneteau did an excellent job and it saved us a ton of time. Okay, so right now we're tracking down the wires in the boat. And uh, at the back of the panel, you can see these are my AC wires. I was looking at these wires originally and I was seeing these numbers on them and I was trying to look them up. But then I got to digging around and uh, it turns out these numbers are actually numbering the wire. This has nothing to do with the gauge. This has nothing to do with the voltage it can handle. This is simply a number so you can track the wires. We've got 201, 202, 200, and 100. So I'm going to go around to the outlet starting with this one. This is an old outlet that we ripped out. This one has wire 2 203 and 200. One of these, as you know, is 200. So I'm assuming this wire goes up to here. So let's draw this map out and see if I can figure out where all of these wires go and what these circuits are. It's awesome because now I don't have to go and ohm wires out. Well, not exactly. We still did continuity tests to double check the numbers on the wires, but it still made the process so much faster. We started by drawing all the outlets, and then we went around to every outlet and took note of the numbers that were on the wires behind the outlet. Once we had all the numbers written down, it was time to connect the dots and make the spider web of all the circuits that were ran. We did it in multiple different colors so that we could tell the difference between all the circuits. And then after the AC diagram, we moved on to the DC, which also had their own set of numbers. 
We started off by following each wire to see where they led. If they didn't go anywhere, well, we'd cut them out and disconnect them. All right, negative 144. Yeah, you can cut that. Pull it. Negative 114. I don't have that. Guts to figure that one out. We went through and followed every wire, making diagrams for all the lights, fans, bilge pumps, you name it. There were so many wires, we had to make an Excel spreadsheet just to keep track of them all. Sasha has wrote down a map of all the lights in the boat. Well, I'm on the starboard side, it's 89 and 69. So she's yelling them out to me, the wires that are in the uh, ceiling on every light, so we can track it down. What, what were the numbers? 66 and 68. Okay, 66 and 68. This 89 you told me has to be 68. Because then it goes 68, 69, 69. Boom. Dyslexic! It took us a few days to track down all the circuits. We were using little spy cameras and looking in every nook and cranny trying to trace down all the circuits in the boat. But despite the hundreds of zip ties, gooey electrical tape, and bird's nest of wires, we went through and figured them out one by one. And we're glad we did, because at the end of the day, we found some shady stuff. Well, this is some janky shit. Oh my god. <laughs> Look at this, dude. Wow. <laughs> That's happened multiple times now. This is why you need to check all the shit. They thought they, they could connect these two 16, 18 gauge wires together with one damn skimpy 22 gauge wire. I'm, this is how you start a damn fire. This is the fuse of this whole line. You can see this bunch of wires and there was some green corrosion on them. And it turns out, if you look at this one, you can see how it's, it's really stiff. It's fat and lumpy. It's hard from here to here. All these have a little green mark. So they all probably need to be cut and re back together. It's a good indication that someone probed the lines to check the voltages. So, this is a voltmeter. For those who don't know, you check your voltage with a voltmeter. Well, you see how pointy these things are. You can stick these through just like this and, and hit the wires in there and you can check voltage that way. It's a terrible way to do it. It's a total last resort, in my opinion. I've actually never done it, but that's what someone did in there, and that's why all those wires have pinholes in them, and then they've started to corrode down the line each way. Luckily, we stuck our head in there and looked up and saw just the slightest little bit of green past some electrical tape, and uh, we found that. So, we crimped number 53 and we still don't have power. This whole back cabin and Sasha just made a miraculous bind. Here is another place in the area which has some green shit coming out of the deal. Another butt connector. Wow. I did not use any heat shrink on any of these connections. Wow. Ooh. That is bad. Ooh. So this is why you have to go through and look at every single part of your boat if you buy from a sketchy guy. I mean, you probably find this stuff on 99% of boats out there, but this boat is bad. We've gone through every switched. wire on this boat. We've gone through every single wire. I wonder if they switched, um, I guess we'll find out in a second, if they switched number wires, which is why it's kind of messy back here, you know? They did back there. Yeah. I don't know if so they So they might have done it here too, which is why when we crimp this, all of a sudden these lights didn't work. The lights on! Anyways, we solved the problem. We're gonna go finish those crimps, and that means that we can start wiring the panel. Good job. So this morning we are going through and we got all of our new cables. We're gonna go through and cut them to the lengths that we need so we can go and run them from our new battery bank to our switches battery panels, all that. So we've got this piece cut, now we're gonna go ahead and crimp it together, and we're gonna do that with all of them. So we began mounting bus bars, crimping, and heat shrinking wires so that we could take the power of our battery bank and spread it throughout the boat. As we worked our way through the process, we made sure to double check all the amperage ratings of the bus bars, the switches, the fuses, and the wire size to make sure that we were installing everything properly. Once we had our main power wires run to the back of the electrical compartment, we began to plan out and assemble the panel. 
This means we had to figure out which switch was going to power which items around the boat, and we had to figure out our fuse sizes. Since this panel was a little bit smaller than the last one and had a bunch of holes in it, we decided to build a new cabinet door for it to go in. And once that was mounted, the process of running wires and figuring out how to organize this huge bird's nest began. We also hooked up our AC wire from our inverter that was going to power the whole AC side of the panel. Now the boat used to be wired in 220, but since we switched to 110, we had to measure the wires that were previously in the boat and make sure they were the right size. Turns out they were 14 gauge wires, so we threw a 10 amp fuse on them and they were good to go. Now these may not be powerful enough to run a skill saw or a blender, so we ran a couple extra outlets with 12 gauge wire and 15 amp fuses. Lastly, we moved to the outside panel. I measured and cut out the hole for the panel, and once again, the process continued, figuring out which switches did what and what size fuses and wires everything needed. After a couple more days of math equations and zip tying wires, we were 95% of the way done. All right, we have our inside and outside switch panels wired up. We are so happy because we are so tired of running wires and trying to explain to you something that was tough for us to understand. Now it's time to channel our energy to a more exciting project, something I've been dying to do since the day we bought the boat. But once again, we're diving into new waters that we've never treaded before, and little did we know how much planning this was actually going to take us. Roth is in the middle of planning out our new hardtop, the frame, and the davit system. I've probably spent a total of 20 hours, just probably longer if you think about all the t-tops and rough sketches and all the measurements and stuff you got to think about. Different angles, we want pipes, all different types of layouts you can imagine and how they're going to work on the boat. You have to think about how far off your dinghy is going to hang and then how it's going to strap up. You got to think about the curvature and the, the cool design, you know, back of the boat, front of the boat, the top of the boat. This is the roof looking down with the solar panels. Here's where your two backstays go through the hard top. That's also, there's just a ton of things you got to think about when designing and you got to make it 3D as possible. So this is a dead on view of the solar panels and hard top, how it's going to meet in the rafter that's going to support everything. This is kind of what I started out with here. This was the original drawing. We've got to figure out how to support it sideways, front and back, side to side. Also how to hold up a thousand pounds, actually probably like a 500 pound dinghy. So we're going to have a ton of solar hanging off the top and also a hard top that we can walk on. So we've done a lot of drawings on this, trying to figure out the design and how we want it to look. I think it's probably going to end up looking something like this, if you can see the pig. On to the last step, we're figuring out how high it needs to be. We're subtracting all the heights from my head height to see how high the frame needs to be built. After going through all the measurements and accounting for the thickness of the frame and the fiberglass, in order for myself to walk under this hardtop without hitting my head on it, we were going to have to raise the boom. Today, one of the projects we're going to go and do is raise the boom. Here comes the boom. Because Raph has tall people problems and cannot stand up straight underneath here. The only thing with that is if you look up here, we don't have a lot of room to go up. And to solve that problem, we are going to raise the boom. It's easy, couple screws, That's take it. them out, move it, put it up. There's some rivets, there's some bolts, and there's some uh, hardware that I've never seen before, but we're just gonna start drilling into it and learn from our mistakes. One thing you need to take into consideration when raising your boom is that you're gonna have to adjust your sails or buy new ones. For us, since we are planning to circumnavigate the world, and this is so short, and we wanna add solar and all that, we felt like it was worth the money to raise the boom and adjust the sails. So we got some quotes to uh, hem our sails for $1,500. And that's to basically cut a half a foot off the top or the bottom of the sail and get it re-sewn. So first thing we need to know how high to raise the boom. Putting this against the mast, just like that, so it's nice and flat. And you come down, and right here you can see our booms sitting pretty much at a 90 which lets us know how high it is over there and how high we need to raise it. Our mast is 78 inches 
to the bottom of this shackle. Now my height, I'm 76 inches. I wanna stand up and chill under this thing. All right, just to be safe, let's put this sucker up to 90 inches. Put it right here, this is how tall I am. This is where we want our hard top to be. Our hard top thickness is gonna be about like that. If we want any solar or some sort of boom holder, we'll just say it's gonna be about this thick, and then we'll have five inches of good clearance, just to be safe. Sound good? Sounds good. 90 inches. So if the bottom of it is at 78, we're going to 90, we're gonna raise it 12 inches. Let's go. So first thing we have to do is move all these ropes. Um, we're gonna do these lazy jack lines. Did I say ropes first? You I don't know. You know what I'm talking about. All right, is that yellow on the topping lift? Yeah. We've got our topping lift tight. So here's your main halyard. We're gonna send this through this guide hole and this, and then just tie a knot that is easy to come undone. That's gonna hold the end of the boom up. Worst case, you can just tie a loop right here and hold it that way. Well, that's the wrong way, you dildo. Watch my language, right? Okay, next up. Let's take this damn bolt out. WD-40 would have been great in this situation. Boom. It's free and hanging. I'm gonna come here. So we took the head off the rivet, now we're taking out the shank. And that's that. So that bracket holds this in. On the slides. Looks good. Oh, okay, that's nice and tight. Uh-huh. We're not too worried about the inside of our mask because no wires in here that work. So we're gonna have to run all new cables and wires so we can drill stress-free. Uh -huh. So here's a rivet. Thank God I was a contractor and have all these tools. It pops it out at the right pressure. We got some distractions. No, Jade, I do not want to get drunk this Sunday morning. How about Saturday? <laughs> What are you doing with all them rivets? We have all these open holes. We're gonna just fill them in with rivets. Nice. Great execution. <laughs> I try. Clearly, it does not look stock. Custom, as clean as this one. But, it's really not that bad. No, we do not want to drink today. <laughs> it's Tuesday, Ayana. Boom. So now we just have to drill a new hole for our stopper screws. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I actually just got some in my nose. Oh, look at that. Perfect. Now, can we put the boom back on? Yep. Here comes the what? Boom. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> just like it was before, right? Exactly. Or should I do it differently? No, just like it was before. All right, perfect. I almost got confused. Looks amazing. Wouldn't you agree? I agree. We did we a great did a job. job. <laughs> what are you doing? Now we can pull up this yellow string. What's it called? Topping string. <laughs> that looks nice. Woohoo! That's, That's way nice. better. And this bad boy will be about right here. Now that the boom has been raised, we are one step closer to starting construction on the hard top. The next step is to create the jig so we can fabricate it off-site. 
Okay, we got some 2x4, some scrap plywood, and a rocking boat. We gotta build a massive jig so that we can fabricate a huge hardtop off-site over an hour away. And when it gets here, it's gotta clear the backstays and all the feet have to hit in the perfect spot. I don't see what could go wrong. We want to thank our patrons for supporting our journey and sticking with us each week through all these projects to help us get out there on the ocean. Our patron wall is really starting to come together and we really want to thank you guys for all your continued support. If you're not into Patreon, you can also like, share, and subscribe to our videos. If each and every one of you just showed one friend and got that one friend to subscribe to our channel, we would have 100,000 subscribers. And we've been working so hard to get there, so please do us a favor and just share this channel with one person. And don't forget, you can also rep Spirit Animal wearing some of our awesome merch. See you guys next week. <laughs>